Hi, everybody. Grab a Bible, open it up to Acts chapter 13. Acts 13. In the early morning hours of April the 15th, 1912, the RMS Titanic sank in the North Atlantic Ocean after striking an iceberg a mere four days into her maiden voyage. There were two boats who responded to the Titanic while it was sinking. One boat, the Californian, was only about 20 miles away. But about 10 minutes before the Titanic had hit the iceberg, the Californian had shut off its radio for the night. And in the dark skies, they watched as flares shot off in the distance, and they couldn't quite figure out why a boat would shoot off flares in the middle of the night. They didn't turn on the radio. They did not investigate. When they saw in the distance in the the dark night the lights of the Titanic go out, they thought it was odd that a boat would turn off their lights in the middle of the night. I mean, the crew of the Californian was too busy maintaining everything that they had going on on their own boat to worry about anything else. But then there was another ship, the Carpathia, was 58 miles away. Its radio was on, and they received the distress call from the Titanic. They powered up all of their engines and navigated full throttle around icebergs for the next three and a half hours. At risk to their own lives, at risk to their own ship, they arrived on site and rescued 705 men and women and children. As the narrative in the book of Acts now shifts to the global mission of the church, we're going to be confronted with the stark reality that too many Christians are in maintenance mode in their faith. They're ignoring the distress calls of an unbelieving world and focusing on their own faith development and disregarding their calling to do everything in their power to help rescue others from certain eternal death. Will you be a maintenance mode Christian or a mission-minded follower of Christ? Will we as a church exist in maintenance mode or will we follow Christ in the adventure of his mission in the world? Acts chapter 13, we'll start in verse 1. Now, there were at Antioch, in the church that was there, prophets and teachers, Barnabas and Simeon, who was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Menean, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. And while they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. When they had reached Salamis, they began to proclaim the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they also had John as their helper. And when they had gone through the whole island as as far as Paphos, they found a magician, a Jewish false prophet whose name was Bar-Jesus, who was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence. This man summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elimus the magician, for so his name is translated, was opposing them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. But Saul, who was also known as Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, fixed his gaze on him and said, you who are full of all deceit and fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all, un- of all righteousness, will you not cease to make crooked the straight ways of the Lord? Now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you and you will be blind and not see the sun for a time. And immediately a mist and a darkness fell upon him, and he went about seeking those who would lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had happened, being astonished at the teaching of the Lord. A few aspects 
of the church's call to missions. There's commission, there's confrontation, and there's conversion. Let's walk through those together. It begins with commission. The text opens up by telling us about this formidable church in the city of Antioch. It will now become the hub of the the global church and is the base of global missions. It's a church that is richly well taught. They have prophets and teachers. Uh, Prophets, those who hear from God and speak on his behalf. Uh, There's no dedicated, confirmed New Testament yet. So God is still miraculously speaking through uh, these gifted men to take his word to his people. And then there are those who are teaching. They are walking through what God has already revealed. Barnabas is listed first, meaning that he is the leader. Now, we were first introduced to Barnabas all the way back in Acts chapter 4, that he's this profoundly generous man, Acts 4, verse 36. Now, Joseph, a Levite of Cyprian birth, it was also called Barnabas by the apostles, which translated means son of encouragement, and who owned a field, sold it, and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. And he apparently becomes a leader very quickly in the church in Jerusalem. And just a few chapters later, by the time Cornelius Uh, The first Gentile convert comes to faith in Christ in Acts 10. Word gets back to Jerusalem that these pagans, these Gentiles, are now in large numbers coming to faith in Christ. The church in Jerusalem dispatches Barnabas to go and find out what's happening. Acts chapter 11, verse 19. So then those who were scattered because of the persecution that occurred in connection with Stephen made their way to Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch speaking the word to no one except the Jews alone. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who came to Antioch and began speaking to the Greeks also, proclaiming the good news of the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a large number who believed turned to the Lord. Now the news about them reached the ears of the church at Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas off to Antioch, who when he arrived and saw the grace of God, rejoiced, and began to encourage them all with a purposeful heart to remain true to the Lord. For he was a good man and full of the Holy Spirit and of faith and a considerable crowd was brought to the Lord. So Barnabas is the the, the front row of this global missions move of the church as it expands. From that point on, he leaves and he goes to get Saul of Tarsus. We know him as the Apostle Paul and he brings him back to Antioch and they teach the congregation together. Listed after Barnabas in the list of prophets and teachers in Antioch is Simeon called Niger and Lucius of Cyrene. Niger is the Latin word for black, where Nigeria comes from. Cyrene is on the North African coast. So we're told right away that this well-taught church is multicultural and has already had a far reach in terms of their missions efforts in the world. Menias is listed next. Menian is a Jewish name, but we're told he was brought up with Herod the Tetrarch. That's the King Herod who killed John the Baptist. The word for brought up, that he was brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, is frequently used as a title for the foster brother. So he's loosely related to King Herod. So now, In the church in Antioch, not only do we have a diversity of colors and cultures, we have a diversity of social and economic status. The gospel knows no barriers. It will cross any wall and bring people into Christ. And last of all in the list is mentioned Saul himself. So not only is this church well taught, they have a whole host of gifted and faithful preachers and teachers. This church is also sacrificial. They know that missions is going to cost them dearly. It might even cost them those dear preachers that they love so very much. Verse 2, while they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I've called them. Without hesitation, the church sacrifices two great teachers. 
Barnabas is their chief leader, and Saul is their most brilliant theologian. And they willingly give them up in the name of continuing to reach the lost. No matter the cost, this is a church willing to pay it. And finally, the church is not only well taught, this church is not only sacrificial, this church in Antioch is deeply worshipful. They're ministering to the Lord and fasting. And as they're doing that, they hear the Spirit speak to them. Verse 3, then when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. They keep fasting. They keep praying. They commission Barnabas and Saul. They send them out on mission. This is a church that's connected to God. They're hearing from God. And when he speaks, they are obedient to what he says. Friends, this is what a church on mission looks like. They love God's word, and they are continually putting themselves into environments where it's being taught. They're serving the Lord. They're living a devotional life. They're opening up God's word, and they're listening for him to speak. And when he does, they obediently give up whatever they need to give up in order to accomplish God's mission in the world. There is no mention whatsoever of this church's elaborate programs, the events that they have. The only mention is their devotion to seek the Lord and reach the lost. So let's talk about missions for a minute. We operate with this fundamental flaw regarding how we view global missions. We separate into a different category those who are quote unquote called into missions, and they do this vocationally. They go to other countries. They serve in in these other kinds of organizations. We separate them from the rest of us, and that is not a biblical distinction. So let me settle the issue right here, right now for you. You are called into missions, period, You are called into missions. In Matthew 28, in the Great Commission, Jesus told his disciples, go and make disciples of all nations. In Acts 1, he told them to be his witnesses to the ends of the earth. Those commands aren't just for them. By the inspiration of the Holy Spirit as the ultimate author of any Bible text, those commands are not limited to that specific time but they transcend time, they transcend culture, and they land directly onto our shoulders today. You are called into missions. The remaining question that you need to answer is this. How then will I leverage who I am and what I have for the sake of missions? You're called into missions. That's not up for debate. How then will I leverage who I am and what I have for the sake of missions? How will you utilize your personality and your gifts that God has given you to help more people hear the truth of the gospel? How will you prioritize your finances to ensure that the mission of the church gets to the lost around the world? How will you leverage your social media How will you leverage your role in your job? How will you leverage your vacations so that the name of Jesus spreads to all the nations in the world? Because you are called to missions. The great commission is your commission. Number two, there's confrontation. Verse four, So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucid, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. Now, after being reminded that missions is not the church's idea, it's God's idea, God himself sends his people out on mission, being sent out by the Holy Spirit, Saul and Barnabas and John Mark, who's their helper, we're told later, they travel 16 miles from Antioch down to Seleucid, they catch a boat, and they sail 60 miles to the island nation of Cyprus in the Mediterranean. Well, why Cyprus? Why bother going there first? Well, 
the Spirit could have told them explicitly to go there. We're not told the content of all that the Holy Spirit could have said. Or it's because Cyprus is already familiar. Because we were told in Acts 4 that Barnabas is from Cyprus. He knows people. He knows the Jewish synagogues. He has connections. He cares deeply for his family and for his friends and for his neighbors, most of which have not placed their faith in Christ. So his burning desire is to take the gospel that has saved him to his home, to his family, to his friends. And they land, they go into the synagogues, and they preach to the Jews there. This is Paul's typical order of things when he arrives in a new city. We'll see this over and over and over again as we go through the rest of Acts. He'll go to the synagogues in a new city. He'll preach to the Jews for a while. He wants them to see their messianic hopes have been fulfilled in Christ. This one you've been expecting for 2,000 years has arrived in Christ. And some will believe. And then others try to kill him. So once the Jews reject... He then goes to the Gentiles. He goes to the pagans. So on the island of Cyprus, they start on the eastern edge of the island in the city of Salamis, and they preach their way over a hundred miles to the capital city of Paphos on the west coast of the island. Luke records no news whatsoever about their success along the way. He only records their faithfulness to do what God had commanded them to do. But everything changes when they get to Paphos. Look at verse 6. When they'd gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they found a magician, a Jewish false prophet whose name was Bar-Jesus, who was with the proconsul, Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence. This man summoned Barnabas and Saul, sought to hear the word of God. But Elimus the magician, for so his name is translated, was opposing them seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. Let's talk about this guy. This is now the second magician that we've encountered in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 8, we already saw Simon the magician that Peter confronts. He's given two names here. He's given the name Elimus, the Aramaic word for magician, and Bar-Jesus, literally son of Jesus or son of salvation. And he is a magician, meaning he operates in dark magic. He operates in incantations and spells and amulets. Basically, he is Jafar from Aladdin. So think that. And he, like all of the magicians of his day, has real power. But the power comes from demons, not from God. We're also told that he's a Jewish false prophet. Now, Jewish and magician should never be used in the same sentence. Because throughout the Old Testament, God had explicitly forbidden any kind of sorcery. Because it involves the occult. It involves demonic activity. So this guy is not truly Jewish in any religious sense but culturally, he comes from a Jewish bloodline, and he is a false prophet. Not necessarily meaning that he issues prophecies that don't come true, therefore he's a false prophet, though it likely includes that. It means that he claims to be a prophet, but that is a false claim. He's not really a prophet. Turn in your Bible to Jeremiah 23. I want you to see a passage with me. Jeremiah 23, throughout the prophets, one of the things that God consistently comes back to is an overwhelming condemnation of false prophets, of those who stand up and declare they're speaking on God's behalf, but God had not actually sent them. They're making it up. And when you say that you speak on God's behalf, but you don't really speak on God's behalf, you are treading in very dangerous waters. Most false prophets, God kills. So we, we dare not be flippant with statements like, God told me. Because if you're not 100% sure of that, you're treading in very dangerous waters. 
if someone comes up to you and says, God wanted me to tell you, and the next words out of their mouth are not scripture, disregard everything they say from that point on. Because only his word is authoritative, not what someone has decided is authoritative. Listen to how God says it, Jeremiah 23, starting in verse 25. This is God speaking. I have heard what the prophets have said who prophesy a lie in my name, saying, I had a dream. I had a dream. How long? Is there anything in the hearts of the prophets who prophesy a lie? Even these prophets of the deception of their own heart who intend to make my people forget my name by their dreams, which they recount to one another, just as their fathers forgot my name because of Baal. The prophet who has a dream may recount his dream, but let him who has my word speak my word in truth. What does straw have in common with grain, declares Yahweh? Is not my word like fire, declares Yahweh, and like a hammer which shatters a rock? Therefore, behold, I am against the prophets, declares Yahweh, who steal my words from each other. Behold, I am against the prophets, declares Yahweh, who take their tongues and declare Yahweh declares. Behold, I am against those who have prophesied lying dreams, declares Yahweh, and who recounted them and led my people astray by their lying and reckless boasting. Yet I did not send them and I did not command them, and they do not furnish this people the slightest benefit, declares Yahweh. God does not like false prophets. And here in Acts 13, this pagan, false prophet, demon worshiper is the advisor to the Roman consul there. The, the, the governmental leader of the region. Sergius Paulus is spoken of very highly here. He's a man of intelligence. And he's apparently heard about the work that Barnabas and Saul are doing on the island. So he summons them because he wants to hear the word of God. He is seeking after truth. But that's why he foolishly had made a pagan warlock his advisor was common in his day, superstitious Roman leaders to utilize magicians to bring out curses on their enemies, to read their fate in the stars, but now he's looking for real truth. And because of that, Elimus immediately starts his work of opposition. He actively undermines the truth of God's word as it's being preached to him. He disagrees, he interrupts, he argues, he scoffs, he does whatever it takes to turn away, literally make crooked the truth of the sermon that he's hearing. Well, Paul will have nothing of it. Now in verse 9, right here in Acts 13, Saul the persecutor officially becomes Paul the apostle. From this point on, Luke will never again refer to him as Saul. Saul. And the only time he will record that is when Paul himself recounts his former days as a persecutor and even calls himself by the name Saul. Saul's his Jewish name. Paul is his Greek name, fitting now that he's in a Greek Gentile context. Verse 9, but Saul, who was also known as Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, fixed his gaze on him and said, you who are full of all deceit and fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease to make crooked the straight ways of the Lord? Now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you'll be blind and not see the sun for a time. And immediately a mist and a darkness fell upon him, and he went about seeking those who would lead him by the hand. Now there's a lot of clever wordplay going on here. Paul is filled with the Holy Spirit, meaning the Spirit has just told him this is what's really going on with this guy and here's the, the punishment that you need to speak against him. Paul's filled with the Holy Spirit. Bar-Jesus is filled with all deceit and fraud. He's a charlatan. His work is mere gimmickry. And while his name may mean son of Jesus, he is actually a son of the devil. 
He's seeking to corrupt God's word, but now at the end, he is seeking someone to hold his hand as he stumbles about in the dark. He's attempting the impossible. He is trying to subvert. He is trying to turn away. He's trying to make God's straight ways crooked. We talked about this last week. This is why we don't focus on success. This is why we focus on faithfulness of taking God's word to the world because his word never fails. It's straight and you cannot make it crooked. His word is incorruptible. His word cannot be defeated, not even by demonic forces. So as you begin to think through your commission from God into missions, you're inevitably going to come up against some obstacles that you're going to have to confront. The realization that you have lived your entire life up to this point for yourself, and you have no idea how to get your life in line with God's mission. The reality of some sin in your life that ruins your Christian witness and would sideline you from God's mission if it was found out the financial mismanagement that has plagued your life and your home because it seems impossible to help fund missions when you can't pay your own bills. The spouse that's not on the same page as you theologically or lines up and has the same commitment to the Lord as you do. The kid's schedule that runs your home. The job that takes all of your time, all of your attention, all of your energy. I don't know what issues you're going to have to confront. I don't know what obstacles that you're going to have to face that seem insurmountable, that these obstacles that up to this point you've decided to give a free pass for you in joining God's mission in the world. But here's what I do know. Whatever sacrifice, whatever awkward conversation, whatever challenge you have to endure to join in God's mission, it is worth it all. Number three, conversion. Go to verse 12. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had happened, being astonished at the teaching of the Lord. Such is the power of the gospel. A man steeped in Greek and Roman polytheism and superstition, being advised by a demonic magician, can hear the truth of Scripture and be saved. Nothing can stand in God's way. Now, there are skeptics who like to say this man really didn't convert. He's not really a Christian. This is all surface level because he was just impressed by the miracle of the blindness. Well, it says he believed, so that's enough. So that, I think, settles all the arguments. And I am quite sure that witnessing your trusted advisor Being struck with immediate blindness would be enough to convince you that what these guys are saying is probably true. But notice the last phrase, being astonished at the teaching of the Lord. That's what converted him. He was astonished. It's the same word used well over a dozen times in the gospel to describe people's reaction to the very teaching of Jesus himself. They are in awe at the truth of his word. Same happens here. The truth of the Bible penetrates his heart and God uses that to save him. What did Paul say in Romans 10? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. So friends, what are you waiting for? This same power in this same word is yours to wield in the world. God commissions you to go and goes with you when you go and empowers you to get the job done. What else do you need? Listen to what Henry Martin wrote. He said, the spirit of Christ is the spirit of missions and the nearer we get to him, the more intensely missionary we must become. That's how it started for the church in Antioch. They were seeking God. 
and that inevitably resulted in seeking the lost. Because here's what happens, guaranteed, when you seek the Lord, you will seek the lost. Because the Lord that you seek seeks the lost. And if you want to walk with him, well, friends, his footsteps go to those who don't know him. Because that's what he did for you. That's what he did for me. He specializes. He delights in going to those who don't know him, to those who are his enemies, and transforming his enemies to become his friend. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the work of Jesus that has come to us. Those who at one time were your eternal mortal enemy. And by the truth of your word, the power of the gospel penetrated cold, dead hearts and you transformed them. You regenerated them. You brought dead souls to life. And now, as we seek you, we will begin to seek those who don't know you. Because we were once lost. We were once blind. We were once dead. But now you've done all the saving work. You've done all the transforming work. And you set us on your mission in the world. Which makes perfect sense. Because it was you who left the glory of heaven to come here on mission to seek and to save that which is lost. And we thank you for your saving work that by your mercy you went to the cross on behalf of sinners like us and removed our sin so that we could be friends of God. So as we do every week, we pause and we remember the sacrificial work of Jesus on behalf of sinners like us. So we take a piece of bread and a cup of juice and we remember Jesus in whose name we pray, amen.